Now, the slope of the tangent line, actually there are three definitions. F prime of X, we talked about the first definition last week, which was the limit of F of X plus, eh, whether you call that H or delta X does not matter. As long as you use the same thing down there. And we want to take that limit as H goes to zero. This is the best definition for first derivative. It's the most robust, the most dynamic. By using this definition, I can come up with a function that is the first derivative. Not just a value, but a function. There, uh, let's see, it just said you left, but I'll bet that was the you that was offline in the first place. Okay, good. Everything good on your end? Yeah. Okay. Now you're only in my meeting once at least. Um, there are a couple of other definitions that you need to be aware of only because the book talks about them. And they can be a little confusing. Uh, F prime uh, at some point, if I want to know that, in other words, if I don't want just a general function, but I want to know an exact value, well, that is the limit of F of C plus H minus F of C divided by H as H goes to zero. So it's not much different. In other words, if I give you a function and I say, what's the value of the function? Let's, let's use, let's try a problem uh, using this definition. Uh, and here I had one right open. Yeah, let's, let's talk about this function here. F of x is equal to 2x minus 3, something real simple. And if I wanted to know what f prime of, or what the derivative at the point 2 comma 1 is, in other words, what is the slope of that function at the point 2 comma 1? Well, since I'm asking for what is the derivative at 2, right, just the x point is 2, then I can use this function. It's the limit of f of 2 plus h minus f of 2 all over h as h goes to 0. And let's go through the algebra. What is f of 2 plus h? If f of x is 2x minus 3. It would be 2 times 2 plus h minus 3. So that's this part. Minus... What? 2 times 2x minus 3. Actually, is all I'm doing is evaluating the function at 2. Oh, okay. Which is 2 times 2 minus 3, or 1. Yeah. Okay. And then I'm going to divide it by h, and I'm going to take the limit of that as h goes to 0. Well... If I simplify this, I get 4 plus 2h minus 3 minus 1 all over h. Notice that anything without an h goes away in the numerator, always. No matter which definition you're using, anything without an h better disappear. Okay? So I'm left with 2h over h 
the H is now cancel. So what is the limit of 2 as H goes to 0? Well, that's equal to 2. So that's telling me that the slope of this function is 2 at the point 2 comma 1. At that point right there, the slope is 2. Well, that's pretty easy to see. That's a linear function. It's a straight line. That's its slope. We didn't need to go through all this calculus to figure out that the slope at that point was 2. The slope at any point anywhere on this line is 2. But that's an example of how to figure out the first derivative at a specific point instead of generally. Don't use this one much at all. Whoops, hold on. Still need the line under that. There is a third one that you do use occasionally to prove continuity. And that is that f prime evaluated at some point c is equal to the limit of f of x minus f of c, all divided by x minus c, the limit as x goes to c. Notice the similarities with the one above and the differences. And where you use that one, I could use that one on the last problem that was linear, but it's, this one is most useful in proving continuity. Even though you're kind of finished, you're not really finished with the chapter in continuity, you're going to deal with continuity for a good while. But if I'm trying to prove whether a function is continuous or not at a certain point, this is the best one to use. And we'll choose an example. Let's look at the function. Uh, hold on. We like to prove discontinuity, and the sample problem it's giving me doesn't do that, but nonetheless, we can still use it. Let's look at this function here. f of x equals the absolute value of x minus 2. Show that it is continuous at x equal to. Well, if I draw a graph of that function, I know it looks kind of like that, right? It's the absolute value function translated two units to the right. So the question is, is can we prove that it's continuous at that point? We can see that it is, but can we prove it? In order to prove it, we have to go through this process here. Well, I'm going to take the limit as... of f of x minus f of 2, in other words, that's that and that, and I'm going to subtract x minus 2, and I'm going to take the limit as x goes to c, which in this case is 2, but I'm going to do it from the left side only, and then I'm going to do it from the right side only, and if they're not the same, then it's not differentiable at that point. And so what this really is, is a way of proving whether something is differentiable at a what is called a corner or a cusp. 
In this case, we have a corner. And you'll be taught that uh, functions are not differentiable at this corner. There is no slope of the tangent line at that point. It might look like it would be horizontal, but it's not. Uh, if I go through the math and figure out what happens to this function as I approach 2 from the left, I've got the function x minus 2 minus f of 2, which is 0, all over x minus 2. Well, as I approach from the left, that's equal to minus 1, the limit of that as x approaches 2 from the left. You see why that's minus 1 and not 1? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, if I do the same process and figure out what that limit is as I approach 2 from the right, I'm going to get plus 1. And I can see from the picture that the slope of the left is minus 1 and the slope on the right is plus 1. But the fact that these two limits, done from the left and done from the right, do not equal the same number, it's kind of like the definition of limits. If the limit from the left does not equal the limit from the right, then the limit does not exist. And if the limit doesn't exist, it's not differentiable there. It is continuous. And there's a different definition, really, for continuity. Uh, this, this book doesn't really address this properly here, but that's okay. I'm not going to try to change that. Um, Let's talk about this function, f of x equals x to the one-third. Is that continuous? It is continuous at zero. Again, if I want to graph it, that looks like this. Okay. We can see that it's continuous, but what is its slope at x equals 0? In other words, what is f prime of 0? Well, I have found after doing tons of these that the best definition to use for doing derivatives is this one right here. It's the most robust, meaning if I use this definition, I will come up with a function as my answer. And then I can figure out what the slope is at any value I want. So if I want to figure out what the slope is at x equals 0, let's just use the easiest method possible, well, in this case, that's the power rule, right? You remember the power rule? Um. Here, let me write the power rule. F prime of x is if, if f of x is equal to x to some exponent, n, then f prime of x is equal to that exponent times x subtract 1 from the exponent. Okay? Yeah. This is the simplest rule of all. The problem is the power rule doesn't apply to all functions. So uh, we need a few other rules also to be able to differentiate all functions. But simple functions like this, this polynomial here, we can certainly use the power rule. So what would f prime of x be? It would be one-third x um, 
to the negative um, two thirds here. Okay, that's the same way as writing it like this. Correct? Yeah. What's the slope at x equals zero? Um, wouldn't it be one over zero? Uh huh. Which is what? Undefined. Correct. Or remember the uh, when we're talking slopes, undefined slope means what kind of slope? Vertical line. Remember the slope of a vertical line is undefined. So when we come up with a derivative that's undefined at a point, I know what my slope is. There's a slope of that tangent line, and they may want you to call it undefined, but it's a vertical line. It's really infinity. In other words, 1 divided by 0, if you take the limit of that, that's infinity. That is an infinite steep slope. Remember how slopes go. That's a slope of one. That's a slope of one half. That's a slope of two. As I get more and more vertical, my slope gets bigger and bigger. That might be a slope of ten. That might be a slope of a thousand. By the time I reach a vertical line, I'm at infinity or undefined. So this is just confirmation of what we can see by looking at it. We can see that at x equals 0, the slope of the tangent line is vertical, which means my first derivative better come out to be either infinity or undefined. And it, it does. Okay. Keep going. If x is differentiable at a point C, then f is continuous at that point C. And vice versa does not apply. In other words, remember this function. I have continuity, but I don't have differentiability right there. But if I had differentiability at every point, then that implies continuity. It works in that direction only. As long as you have differentiability, you have continuity. At on that last problem, we, we can differentiate throughout that thing. Even though the, the derivative, you might say, is undefined at x equals 0, it's still, I can differentiate anywhere along that function. There's no point I cannot differentiate it. There is no point that I cannot find the slope of the tangent line. That means that it's continuous. Okay? If I took a different function, say the greatest integer function, which looks like this, remember the greatest integer function? Uh, y equal. that. And sometimes they put double brackets around it. But not always. Sometimes it's just single brackets. This is the greatest integer function. Clearly we can see it's not continuous. I have to pick up my pen to draw it. And that's the layman's definition of continuity. Is if you have to pick up your pencil to draw the function, then it's not continuous. So it's not continuous there. It's not continuous there. So it's not differentiable there either. If it were differentiable at these points, then it would be continuous. So if it's not continuous, it's not differentiable. There is no slope of the tangent line at that point right there. 
because it's not continuous. You can see that its limit from the left is 0 and its limit from the right is 1. <coughs> so the limits are not the same from the left and the right, then the derivative isn't the same from the left or the right either. <coughs> Excuse me a moment. Just give you some functions and you tell me the derivatives. The function's equal to three, what's the derivative? Notice that I could have written this as 3 times x to the 0 power. Hmm. Let me think about that for a second. Yeah, and now if I use the power rule, I get 0 times x to the minus 1, which is 0. Right? So the derivative of all constants is zero, no matter what the number is. Its first derivative is zero. And it's just kind of easier to memorize that the derivative of constants is zero. Okay. How about minus 5x? Zero. No, I'll use the power rule. So it would be, there's an implied one there. So it becomes minus 5 times 1 times x to the 0. What's x to the 0 equal to? 1. Always. Anything to the zero power is one. So the power rule just makes this minus five. So anytime your function has x and it's linear like this, in other words, that's a straight line, right? It's a straight line with slope of minus five. That's what that function looks like. Well, first derivative means slope. Well, I can see that no matter where I'm at on the x-axis, the slope is still minus 5, always. In other words, when you have a straight line function, its slope never changes. It's the same at any point on the line. So whenever you have a function that is linear, then its derivative using the power rule is just the coefficient. Okay. This time I have a function of s. What is f prime of s? First of all, what's because we have a polynomial here, you can when you're doing derivatives, the derivative of the sum is the same as the sum of the derivatives. In other words, I can take the derivative of that separately and add it to the derivative of that. What's the derivative of three? What's the derivative of two-thirds s? So there's my answer. Two-thirds. Okay. Let's 
get harder. In other words, here we have a quadratic. It's just three terms, which means I can find the derivative of this entire function by differentiating each term. As long as it's addition or subtraction taking place, you can do that. If it's multiplication or division, you cannot. We'll get to that later. But take the derivative of each of these terms. What do you get? What do you get here? What's the derivative of 2x squared? Subtract 1 from the exponent. Oh, it's right? In other words, you multiply that by that, and then you subtract 1 from that. Well, 2 minus 1 is 1, so that becomes 4x. What's the derivative of x? 1. And the derivative of minus 1? 0. So this is my answer. So taking the derivative of polynomials is pretty easy. You just differentiate each term using the power rule. And I could give you a, a function that was to the seventh power, followed by a bunch of terms to the sixth and the fifth and the fourth, and it wouldn't be hard to do at all. In fact, let's just do one. Uh, 3x to the fourth minus... 5x squared plus 2. Differentiate that. It's the first term. 12x squared. Is it squared? I'm subtracting 1 from the exponent. No, I keep subtracting my 2. Okay. What's the next term? Uh, minus 10x, or 10. No, you're right, 10x. In other words, subtracting 1 from the exponent leaves x to the 1 power, plus 0. So this is the derivative. So you can see that no matter how complicated or high of the degree of the polynomial, I can still use the power rule really easy. Okay? Where I have difficulty differentiating is if I have things being multiplied together. In other words, if I have x times the square root of x plus 1, now I got this being multiplied by that. I can't do it the same way. I can't take the derivative of this and multiply it by the derivative of that. You just can't do it. You can only do that when addition and subtraction is happening. So just remember that, that I cannot do that one that way, and I couldn't do something like this that way either. This is division. I'm going to have to use something called the quotient rule. To do this one, I've got to use something called the product rule. And do we want to get to that yet? Nah, let's not quite. Let's drill a little bit more on just finding derivatives without getting into the product rule. They don't get to the product rule until chapter 2.3. So you're a ways away from the product rule. Power rule, you might as well learn it now because you're going to use it tons. Um, in other words, once you get past chapter 2.1, nobody uses the limit definition of derivative to do it. They use either the power rule, the product rule, the quotient rule, or the chain rule. Those four rules. And we'll get to each one. But for the moment, let's just stick with the power rule. Let me give you a couple more functions.
the easiest way to do these problems, like this one, is to express it with an exponent. How would I write this using an exponent? Because if I have an exponent, I can use the power rule. But I don't have an exponent there now. If you say x minus 1 to the negative 1 power. There you go. Now use the power rule on that. So would it be negative 1 times x 1 to the negative 2 power? Like that. Which is negative 1 over x minus 1 quantity squared. So even if they give it to you in this format, it's almost always you're going to want to convert it to where it's an exponent so that we can use the power rule. The whole, if we can use the power rule, that's always the easiest way to differentiate something. Okay? And that would be the derivative. Notice what we're looking at there is a hyperbolic function. Um, something, let's see, you got a vertical asymptote at x equal 1, horizontal asymptote there, and it's like this and like this. Whoops, the left part. In other words, there's a graph of that function. And if I want the slope, notice that for all negative x's, In fact, for any point on there, I have a negative slope, right? doesn't matter where I select my point on the x-axis. If I select it there, my slope's negative. If I select it here, my slope's negative. If I select it up here, slope's negative. If I select it right there, it's negative. It's negative over there. So no matter what value of x you plug in, you're going to get a negative answer because the top's always negative and the bottom's always positive. And that's verified by the graph. We should get a negative slope. The most important thing to remember about first derivative is it means slope. You don't ever want to forget that, is that it has to equal the slope of the function. And negative two times x to the to the negative third power. Good. You got it down, and that is negative 2 over x to the third. Notice how this function graphs. That function graphs like this. Well, now we're looking at positive slopes over here, negative slopes over here. Is that what that gives us? Well, when x is negative, the denominator is negative, the numerator is negative, I should have a positive slope, and I do. When x is positive, the numerator is negative, the denominator is positive, I should have a negative slopes, and I do. So that indeed is the first derivative, and it matches what we see. What's the derivative, what's the slope at x equals 0? Zero. No. Plug in zero for this. Oh. It'll be undefined. Undefined, exactly. In other words, it's not differentiable 
at x equals zero. A little different than the, the curve that looked like this. At that point had a vertical slope. This, I don't, you can't really say that there's a vertical slope. Obviously, the slope on the left of zero approaches a vertical line, and the slope on the right of zero approaches a vertical line as we get closer and closer to zero. So you might, but it's not continuous. In other words, the graph of this function is not continuous, therefore it's not differentiable. It has to be continuous to be differentiable at the point that we're concerned with. It's not continuous at x equals 0, therefore the derivative does not exist at x equals 0. Different than this, that was continuous at x equals 0, and you could even say the slope of the tangent line was vertical, which means the same thing as undefined, I guess, although this situation here is not the same as that. That clearly is not continuous. This was. How can I write that with an using an exponent? Radicals are not very helpful in calculus. Almost every single time you see a radical, you want to change it to an exponential. Because we're we're bound to want to use the product or the power rule at some point. I don't know how to use the power rule if I'm looking at a radical sign. I know how to use it if I'm looking at an exponent of one half. What's the derivative of that? One over two, two times root x plus one. To the negative one half, which is equal to what you said. And now, because they gave us the problem with a radical, it's okay to put a radical back in as an answer like that. If I was taking a test, that would be my answer, not this. Only because I think the convention is, is that you give answers in the way that the problem was given. If they gave you the problem with a radical, give the answer with a radical even though we had to convert it to an exponential in order to get the answer. We still want to convert it back to a radical once we have the answer. Okay. And finally, I don't want to get too far ahead of where you're at in class, but I'm sure that if we only do one hour a week, you're going to advance faster through the book than you and I can cover. So I don't mind getting a little ahead. Okay. Although that certainly didn't happen in the last week. You didn't get much further. But I'm fully expecting that by next Friday you will be well into Section 2, Chapter 2. Uh, at least this part here. So rewrite that. Four times x to the negative one half. Now take the power rule and apply it. Negative two x minus um, one and a half. I would leave it as an improper fraction. When you're talking exponents, this is actually much easier to interpret than one and a half is. In other words, if I have something and I say it's x to the 3 halves, I know what that is. That's the square root of x cubed. Okay? If I have something that says x to the 1.5 power, 
it's not as easy to translate it and in, back into radical format. Okay, so this is your answer, um, and uh, that that might be a lot of times they'll say never use negative exponents. So I might want to say, okay, that's negative two over x to the three halves. And if I really was insistent on putting the answer in radical form, I would say minus 2 over the square root of x cubed. In other words, that's what that means. The bottom part of the fraction is the root. The top part of the fraction is the power. So what is the number 8 to the 2 thirds equal to? Always do the denominator first. In other words, find the cube root first. And then square it. So that's equal to 4. Notice if I do it the other way around. If I square it first, now I've got to find the cube root of a very big number, 64. In other words, if I do it the numerator first, now i got to solve that, which is no big deal here. I know the cube root of 64 is 4, but if I had 27, now it does matter. I can do this problem without a calculator if I do the bottom first. What's the cube root of 27? 3 squared is 9. Really easy. Whereas if I square it first, now I've got 27 squared, and I've got to take the cube root of that. I'm going to need a calculator. So whenever you have a number to a fractional exponent, a lot of times you can do it without a calculator if you just do the bottom part first. All right, let me see if I can find. Well, all right, this is a good question here. Find the equation of the tangent line at a given point. This is almost the quintessential differential calculus problem is finding the equation of the tangent line at a point. Okay, our function is this. And our point is this. So, how are we going to find the equation of the tangent line? Well, you know that the equation of the tangent line has a slope involved in it, right? If it's a line, it's got a slope. So the first thing we're going to need is the slope of the tangent line. What is the slope of the tangent line equal? 2x or just 2x? It equals the first derivative, which is 2x. So at that point, what is the slope? At the point 2 comma 5, what is the slope of the tangent line? 4. That what you said, 4? Having a little hard time hearing you, um, but uh, that's okay. I can, I can figure it out. So our slope is 4. And now, to come up with the equation of the tangent line, well, there's a format, if you'll remember from your pre-calc in Algebra 2, that's called point-slope format, right? In other words, you got, you got slope-intercept, which is y equals mx plus b. And then you got slope-point which is y minus y sub 1 equals m times x minus x sub 1. Now, you don't use that a whole lot prior to calculus. They teach it to you. 
but you don't end up using it very much. But in calculus, you would love it because what do we have? We have a slope and we have a point. That's why it's called slope point. So what's the equation of the line? Y minus I equals M, oh no, not M, 4 times X minus 2. That's it. That's the equation of the tangent line. It's in slope point format, but that's okay. Had they said, give it to us in slope intercept format, then I'd merely have to do a little algebra, distribute the 4, move the 5 over, and I get y equal 4x, see, minus 8 plus 5 would be minus 3. So there's the slope of the tan, or there's the equation of the tangent line. And equations of tangent lines are always going to be linear. Always. Because the tangent line is a line. It's not a parabola. It's not a curved line. The function may be curved. In other words, I could have a curved function like this. But the slope of the tangent line at any point is going to be linear. It's going to be a straight line. No matter where I'm at, it's always a straight line. But the equation of that tangent line, I could come up with using this technique. Okay. Um, I think... You want to go another five minutes? I, I believe you and I started pretty close to seven, six forty four, uh, okay. nine forty five your time. No, not nine forty five, eight forty five. Uh, you want to go to nine forty five? Okay. Let's do a couple more of these until we run out of time, because, like I said, these are absolutely the most important thing you can get that you can be able to do for differential calculus is figuring out the equation of the tangent line. Not necessarily the slope of the tangent line, the equation of it. Or the equation of the line that is normal to the tangent line. That's another problem. We know how to do that because the slope of the normal is the negative reciprocal of the slope of the tangent line, right? So we know at a minimum to come up with the equation of the tangent line, I got to find the slope. Slope means first derivative. What's the first derivative of this? Plus... Um, zero. Oh, this part right here. Two. Two. In other words, whenever you have an x with a coefficient in front of it, this derivative is always the coefficient. Okay? So what is my slope, m, at minus 3, comma 4? Negative 4. Okay. Now use slope point format to come up with the equation of this tangent line. Y minus 4 equals... Hold on. Okay. No, you're correct. Sorry. My mistake. So minus 4 times... It's x minus x sub 1. X. x plus 3. See why? You two minuses. In other words, it's it really is this. It's x minus x sub 1. Well, x sub 1 is minus 3. So it's x plus 3. So that, 
I'm not going to simplify it. You don't need to. This is just as valid as putting it in a slope-intercept format. That's the equation of the tangent line. If I said, what is the equation of the normal line at that point, what is the answer? The slope of the normal line? Uh-huh. Well, first of all, let's answer that. What's the slope of the normal going to be? If the slope of the tangent line is minus 4, what's the slope of the normal line? Uh-huh. So now, what is the equation of the normal line? Y minus 4 equals what? You got it. And that's how you find, and notice that that's a quadratic, and the first derivative is a linear function, but remember that even if the first, first derivative was a quadratic, you would still evaluate it at this point to figure out what the slope was. In other words, the slope is always going to be a specific number, even if the first derivative is a cubic. And you're just going to plug in the x value to figure out what the slope is at that point. All right. That's quite a bit. That's probably a good place to stop. Um, that is going to get you off to a really good start on your section 2.1. We've basically gone through section 2.1 completely. Okay? I will talk to you next Friday night at 8 o'clock your time. And is all I will do is text you the meeting ID number. I won't call you. Does that work? Okay. I have I have your phone number. Um, yours is 2028, right? Yeah. So I will just, I won't even do anything but text a nine-digit number to your phone number. So next Friday night at 8, when you get a nine-digit number, you'll know what it is. It's the meeting ID number for the GoToMeeting program. Okay. Okay? So I'd have a good week. Calculus is a lot of fun because it's very, very challenging. But it is very challenging, and it gets nothing but harder from here forward. Uh, talk to you next week. Have a good one. Okay, you too.